Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Be best in the ICO later. Thank you all very much for making it out. I'm happy to be here back again for my third time in Thailand. Thank you for Stephanie and Cara and everyone else at Yellow and Tokenomics who have helped coordinate the event. My name is Nicholas Merton. I run a YouTube channel in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, we have around 314,000 subscribers globally. And today I want to spend some time to talk about a topic that has really gathered my excitement over the past year. Uh, there's been a lot of exciting things in cryptocurrencies, and I think a lot of people focus on enterprise applications for blockchain as well as real-world use cases for mobile applications that we can interact with in our day-to-day -day lives. But there's one application, what I believe is the killer application of cryptocurrencies, and that is money itself, what Bitcoin originally intended to create. And there's one place in the world that really captured my interest this year, which is telling a story of something much larger that I think is going to unfold over the coming decade and will lead to inevitable adoption. So with every great new technology, there tends to be a problem that that, sol that technology is going to solve. And in this case, we're dealing with something that is brewing within emerging markets. You've probably seen it through a variety of headlines across the world. It doesn't matter what media outlet you look at. A variety of countries, such as Turkey and countries in South America, like Venezuela, Brazil, and Argentina, have been dealing with currency crises. And these stories are starting to spread very similar to what, what is known as contagion, and it's a very common effect in economics where we see one currency crisis act like a domino and spawn a domino effect from country to country. So it looks like we're having contagion 2.0, and it's starting to hit not just South America, but Turkey and Iran, in a variety of countries. This is not just sparked by simply mismanagement of monetary policy. It can be caused by geopolitical crises, very divided political climates, but sometimes as well by debt mismanagement and inevitably a mismanagement of the printing of currency. So we can see here as well, in other regions like South Africa, where there's a geopolitical crisis and people feel that they were on the verge of civil war in an area of the world that was very prosperous, one of the most prosperous nations in Africa. Turkey and Iran, the Iranian real has become one of the least valued currencies in the world over the past few years. And even in Asia as well, in the Philippines. So we can see that there's no area that's immutable to this or resistant to some kind of attack. And the reason for this is because we're a global economy and all money and currency on, operates on a similar debt-based system. So no matter the label you put on it, we operate in a very similar framework. But it would be ignorant to think that this is not going to continue to spread and that not only is this going to be a vulnerable case in emerging markets, but it is going to be in developed economies, in India, in China, in Russia, and even countries like Canada, Australia, and yes, even the United States, I believe over the coming decade or two, if things get worse enough, will be challenged and we will need an alternative solution. So what's going to possibly cause all of this? There we go, sorry. So we have to go back through a little bit of a story. Um, the crisis that has spawned a lot of this originates actually from what's driven a lot of emerging markets. Uh, I study as a macro trader, I study a variety of different markets across the board, and as we all know there was the uh, boom during the early 2000s that led to the industrialization of China and so many countries, and this led to what was known as the commodities bubble of the 2000s. And this was mostly due to the fact that China was industrializing at a rapid rate. You had massive demand for industrial commodities like copper, iron, steel, and even energy-based commodities such as coal, oil, and natural gas. But with every bubble comes a burst, and it comes with a cost. It means lowering prices. The problem here is that this hurt more than anything, not the United States and developing countries, but emerging market economies, which are heavily export-based. The problem, however, later on is that oil and natural gas saw a continued glut in supply, and this again had a further weighing effect on emerging markets, setting them in an even larger downward spiral. And not to mention as well, you've got a belly of a beast of problems in all these countries already in the first place. Uh, an energy crisis is one thing, but Dollar-denominated debt is a huge problem. The reason Turkey itself has been facing a currency crisis is because it was overexposed to U.S. debt. 
To basically explain this, it means that the debt that they were borrowing was in dollar terms. And if the currency saw, for example, uh, a devaluation of practically 50% comparative to the dollar, that means that their debt obligation has doubled. So it would be like owing twice the amount on your mortgage, to put it in perspective, or your car loan or student loans. Along with that as well, India and China, economies that seem that they've not only industrialized but almost seem almost impermeative to a recession with the growth rates that they've seen, have a massive crisis of shadow banking. And that sounds like a very scary term, but to put it simply, it means banking practically less regulated, less oversight, uh, and less you know, oversight as to whether or not consumers are creditworthy. And the third thing as well that's played into this as another factor is the tightening on global liquidity. In 2017, there were two major things that happened. A continued rise in interest rates, which made it difficult to get more money from the United States, but also the new tax law that was implemented. And this led to a short window of time where money could be repatriated back to the United States. And with this, hundreds of billions of dollars of global liquidity that were in emerging markets and developing economies came right back home to the United States. So all of these factors are starting to come in, and as a domino effect, they're starting to knock down one another. So is this crisis starting off in emerging markets and then potentially in developing, uh, developing economies grows worse and worse, when it starts to not only lead to geopolitical crises and debt crises, but inevitably the worst of all, currency crises? What's going to come in as an optimal solution? What's going to come in to provide a store of value, but also a means of transferring that value and being able to be truly financially sovereign in uncertain times? I believe this will inevitably lead, not tomorrow, not a year from now, but over the next decade or so, to a revolution in the way we view money and a transmission from standard digital money to crypto money. I believe that Bitcoin and other digital currencies are going to be the way of the future. No matter if we think we're using cryptocurrencies or know we're using crypto, or if we actually view them by the brands that we know them by in the crypto space. So I'm going to talk about the properties here uh, that's set up for this situation. So what makes an ideal country? Where is a test subject that we could look for at the moment that shows us whether or not cryptocurrencies can serve as a replacement to kind of test upon this hypothesis? Well, there's three things that I came to a conclusion on that have been historically shown to be signs of a failing economy. The first one is hyperinflation, mismanagement of the currency, printing it into oblivion. This has happened dozens of times over the last century and a multitude of times throughout history because money has always operated on those similar mechanics. Along with that, governments have implemented capital controls. So this means that a government has gone through the ability to censor uh, forex transactions, or basically keeping people from, let's say, for example, I lived in Venezuela and I had the Venezuela Bolivar, and I wanted to transmit it to Canadian dollars or U.S. dollars. Instantly, the government has the control over those payment networks because they are centralized. They depend on digital systems that are owned by digital corporations. So they're very easy to shut down. And third, the government does not provide solutions. The government doesn't have a reason to provide solutions because any solution that would solve the problem would keep them from most likely continuing to hold power in the future. They won't be able to make the same reckless mistakes again. There's one country in the world that has met all three of these, and it's become the poster child for this crisis of currencies, and that's Venezuela a country rich in oil, rich in so much potential for commodity exports, even in an economy that has been facing issues in emerging markets, um, in our energy markets. So what can we look towards in Venezuela that's actually proved this as a cryptocurrency use case? There's been one really cool success story, and I'm very thankful that early on in 2018 I caught on to it because I heard early word that they were going to be pushing efforts in Venezuela because they saw the crisis and they saw the proper solution. And that was Dash, otherwise known as digital cash. This is one of the top 10 to 15 cryptocurrencies that are out there that aims to simply be what it claims to be, digital cash for a global economy. And they have an extremely exciting success story in a market which has seemed so negative and so detrimental where everything's been seeing to go down. Dash has been continuing to grow. Over the last year, 
Dash has been able to 5x its merchant adoption in the middle of a bear market. It's gone from around 800 merchants up towards around 5,000 just about a week or two ago. And this has led towards one of, being, one of being, being one of the most amazing success stories in cryptocurrency so far. Now, the reason they're able to do this, they're able to get Dash as a brand out there, because that's what we're doing here, we're getting these digital crypto brands out, is through what's known as the treasury model. And now a lot of other currencies have started to look towards this model, some have adopted them, but it's a success story behind Dash as a technology because with every new block that is mined on the Dash blockchain, a small bit of the block reward of the new coins minted goes into the treasury, which is voted on or allocated on by people who have a large stake in the Dash network, so participants who have a lot of Dash. And they've funded entire efforts where they've gotten dozens of individuals on the ground, boots on the ground, showing people what this technology can do. And stores and users are absolutely in love with it because it's a way to exchange value very easily. They provide the payment network. They provide the infrastructure, the applications on mobile phones to start accepting this. And it's caked like wildfire. So it's really exciting to see. Uh, and they've, they've employed a lot of successful methods that has gotten to seeing higher transaction throughput on the network as well. So this is a, a little bit of a video here that I wanted to show you all because I think it's one thing to talk about all the data, but to really see it in the first time. Uh, this is uh, a video that was published by a local community participant in the Dash community in Venezuela at a local Subway. And who here knows about Subway from the United States? Big, big sub franchise in the United States that's also based in Venezuela. And interestingly enough, they were going to demonstrate how you could pay with Dash and you could do it at a major retailer like Subway. But interestingly enough, they not only show how convenient it is to send Dash payments through a QR system within a matter of seconds, but ironically enough, they actually had to use Dash because Venezuela's payment network was offline during this time. It has frequent shutdowns, and this happens through a variety of countries in South America. It's very inefficient, not to mention you're dealing with a currency in Venezuela that's going to continuously devalue, as we've seen. A good perspective is that uh, in Venezuela, it takes 24 million Venezuelan bolivar to buy one chicken. So just imagine how expensive a sub is. <laughs> so as we take a look at our test subject here, we see the kind of success. What does Dash and crypto as a whole offer to Venezuela and countries like it? So we talked about hyperinflation. Dash itself along with the vast majority of cryptocurrencies, are either limited and or finite in nature. And there's a difference between those two terms. Limited means that, in some sense, we can know that there is some limitation. For example, it could be fixed inflation on the currency, maybe 1% or 2% every year. Or it could be that it's finite, like Bitcoin, that we know that there will never be more than 21 million coins. And to a country that's experienced hyperinflation, to know that, to know that it's limited or finite, is revolutionary. Sourced in the code, everyone knows the protocol, and everyone's playing by the same rules. Capital controls. The government cannot censor Dash transactions. This is really impactful. So, whereas traditionally, if I wanted to go ahead and swap currencies, it's, it's heavily in a digital framework, but Venezuela is still a cash-based economy. So they can use websites, lo local bitcoins, and a variety of other meetup sites, or just simply messaging through one another to exchange Venezuelan Bolivar or other forms of value for Dash. And Dash has private send, which means that you can do private transactions that the Venezuelan government can't track, and has no identity over who they are and how much is being sent. So again, not only is not censorship resistant, but private as well, which is very important for those who fear the government. This is my favorite one here. The government has not provided any serious solutions. Dash and crypto are the solution. And the best thing about it is they're not asking for permission. It's a very impactful thing about crypto. It was a quote that I saw from Andreas uh, about a year or two ago, Andreas Antonopoulos, big speaker in the crypto space. He said that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are not asking for permission. They're not asking for the Venezuelan government to give regulatory approval. They're not going to wait three or four years for Venezuela to create another fiat currency and to, again, regain the trust of the Venezuelan people. It's not waiting because it's here now. 
And Venezuela's treasury model and its technology and cryptocurrencies like it are here to stay to start stealing that market share. Because for the first time, Venezuela and every other country in the world who has the same mismanagement of monetary policy, where people see their entire life savings stripped away from them in an instant because of a government who didn't know what it was doing, they have the opportunity to say that they're stepping out of the system, to opt out. And it's extremely exciting. I believe it's the reason why it's the best application for cryptocurrencies as a whole. But I want to be clear here, as much as I get very passionate about this and excited, it's truthful that we have a very long way to go. 5,000 merchants is nothing in the sense of the grand scheme of uh, global adoption. There's tens of millions of merchants across the world. So this is not a new paradigm, it's not mass adoption, but it's a start. And I'm excited to see one of the first early test subjects proving that cryptocurrencies are valuable for the world. And I believe that Venezuela won't be the only one. The thing I would always recommend, though, to everyone here, uh, no matter where you come from, no matter what financial conditions you live under at the moment, the best thing you can do is, no matter if it's a bull or bear market, no matter what price is doing, is to continuously get out there and play a role in showing people what this technology can do. Because it starts a viral effect. And I'm very passionate to see people starting to take their own steps to become their own bank, to step away from these trusted systems. It starts off one by one from all of us in the community, and I think together we can all leave a major social impact by letting people know that they can become their own bank and to say screw you to the Venezuelan government and others like it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, any questions? Uh, is there, I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, most of these governments are funded on uh, taxes, and uh, um, is, is there, I mean, how is that going to affect these uh, even corrupt governments or mismanaged governments as far as being able to extract uh, taxes to be able to provide, you know, social services and municipality services and things of that sort? That's a good question. Um, you know, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, especially all of the new privacy technology like uh, Memblewemble that came out that really obscure any data on transactions, it's a really interesting question. Uh, and I, I think this is something that would, is, is very much admired by libertarians and kind of the anarchist types who, the cypherpunks who got into it. Um, it's setting up an interesting paradigm. What are they going to do? I think what you're going to see, even though this might seem very dystopian, is uh, you're not going to see governments hold or as they, uh, they commonly do in today's world, what you're going to see is a variety of new de or decentralized autonomous organizations or um, basically what's known as DAOs start to form and operate. Basically digital communities that are operating under the same rules where I know that I'm paying in a certain amount of my crypto or a certain amount of my wealth and I'm getting services for it. It's actually, I think, going to start setting up competition and uh, better, uh, you know, collective services where we all pull in similar to insurance. Um, I, I've seen it, for example, myself, I, I've, I used to be under traditional insurance, and I've gone more towards a traditional model where it's literally just as simple as everyone pulling in money and getting a service out of it. And I pay them. Yeah, yeah, but can't they just uh, do what China does and just uh, start uh, shutting down certain types of uh, uh, internet protocols and, and start censoring um, you know, the, the type of data that is allowed in, in and out of the country? You know what? They could probably do that, and it would probably be effective enough right now. But if things got so bad enough, the Chinese government, uh, for example, hyperinflated the Chinese yuan because they maybe had too high debt, debt obligations or they felt that it would be necessary for the currency. I can tell you there's a lot of interesting ways, uh, not only through the privacy technology that's getting built for crypto, but uh, there's a lot of interesting ways through the common messaging apps that people use, like WeChat, to obscure certain data and to make a Bitcoin transaction seem like a cat photo. <laughs> so there's a lot of unique ways that people get around it. And I can tell you, the more you pressurize that, uh, maybe in, in certain economies, more people would be complacent. But I feel that after you push people far enough, similar to cases like Venezuela, cryptocurrencies come right around the corner and uh, technology always leads comparative to governments. 
Um, I just wanted to ask about the, um, the merchants, 5,000. Do you know what the current volume is in terms of like transactions? Like how many people are actually using it? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, so I, I've been basically trying to dig up data sets. Uh, now there's a, there's a good way to kind of see whether or not there's real merchant adoption. The best form right now is people actually, the, um, the exchanges on local Bitcoins between Bitcoin, uh, so excuse me, not Bitcoin, uh, with uh, um, Dash and Bitcoin and a variety of other cryptos to the fiat pairing. There's no good metric right now for how much these merchants are taking in because we don't know their addresses, not to mention they could use a variety of public addresses. I would love to see the Dash organization, and I can actually leave a word for them to start actually setting a metric like that to share it, not so much individual company, but broader, the broader pool of companies in Venezuela. I can say this though, um, these aren't just simple, you know, with all due respect, mom and pop shops. They've been able to get what's known as uh, Church's Chicken. It's one of the biggest fast food franchises in Venezuela to accept Dash as a currency. And I also looked as well, the one bit of data that they do provide is what industries uh, are these companies are made up of. So this isn't just simply e-commerce shops uh, or, for example, ATMs. They've got a whole basket of business and IT solution companies, uh, retail stores from clothing to food, all kinds of stuff you can think of, excepting Dash. Yeah. The vast majority, yes. Um, now, the reason the vast majority is coming out of Venezuela is, A, the dire situation, but also as well, that's um, the, the whole team uh, efforts that they've had in Venezuela, the advertising efforts, have been funded by the Dash Treasury. And they're taking this successful model. It was their first test pilot. They're taking it into a variety of other South American countries and countries across the world. I think they're looking at uh, potentially Turkey. Um, I think there's, there's a few others as well. I'm, I'm blanking on it at the moment. But it's exciting take what was such a successful model and planting the seed in all these different countries. I got to give credit to Dash. I'm almost envious of it. They've made a huge success with this. Um, and I'm happy more than anything to see people taking their financial sovereignty back through. All right. Uh, um, thank you so much for those fantastic questions. And thank you so much, Nicholas Merton, for another amazing talk. Wonderful. Welcome to the stage. Is essentially that the internet began printing its own money.